Amniotic Fluid More Than Miss the Eye by Dr. Mogete, supervised by Dr. Armatas. Objectives To elaborate on essentials of amniotic fluid, to review amniotic fluid as an indicator for further medical evaluation or even delivery, to review complications involving amniotic fluid. Definition Amniotic fluid is the hypotonic fluid surrounding the fetus from around eight weeks gestation. Its composition is mainly water. 98% of it is water with small molecules dissolved in it. In early first term, amniotic fluid is similar to extracellular fluid. The volume increases progressively till around 32 weeks gestation, where it remains steady and starts decreasing from about 40 weeks gestation. At about 10 weeks gestation, there's about 30 ml of um, amniotic fluid. And at 16 weeks gestation, there's around 200 ml of amniotic fluid. And in the mid third trimester, is around 800 ml. Production. Before 10 weeks gestation, amniotic fluid is mainly made from skin transudate as well as uh, placenta and cord transmembranous and intramembranous transudates. Between 8 and 11 weeks gestation, fetal urine production starts. And this is a major contributor of amniotic fluid production in the second trimester, contributing about a liter per day. Beyond 20 weeks, amniotic fluid is mainly from the kidney production via urine. Hence, lethal kidney disorders are diagnosed after 18 weeks gestation. Between 22 and 25 weeks gestation, skin keratinization occurs. And if uh, fetuses are delivered before this time, they are prone to fluid loss through the skin. In advanced gestation, respiratory system also contributes, producing around 350 milliliters of amniotic fluid per day. Most of the amniotic fluid is resolved via the gastrointestinal tract, around 500 ml to 1,000 ml per day. In maternal dehydration, there will be a plasma increase in a plasma osmolality, leading to fluid transfer from the fetus to the mother. This is why rehydrating the mother, giving intravenous fluids, tends to correct the suspicious looking CTGs. Function of amniotic fluid. It is multifunctional. It provides a cushion around the fetus and absorbed pressure and shock protecting the fetus. It also provides lung and GIT development. So the breathing movements, the in and out fluid uh, movements into the uh, lungs allows the muscular skeletal system around the, the lungs to develop, the muscles involved in breathing, and also the lungs to develop. Swallowing of the fluid contributes to GIT development. It also assists in skeletal system development. So it provides a physical space for the fetus to move around, developing the neuromuscular system. It also prevents cord compression. Assessment of amniotic fluid. 
it's carried away via semi-quantitative uh, deep vertical pool measurements as well as somnotic fluid index measured in centimeters. This is done with a probe perpendicular to the floor and parallel to maternal long axis. Taking FI, the uterus and the abdomen is divided into four quadrants. So from the abdominal point of view, a vertical, imaginary vertical line is drawn along the linear nigra. And the second line is drawn horizontally passing through the maternal umbilicus. And the fluid, the DVPs are measured in each and every quadrant, then added up together. We use DVP single measurements usually for gestations before 24 weeks and also for multiple gestations as well as um, when following the SGA protocols. So DVP of more than eight signifies polyhydraminous and less than two centimeters will diagnose oligohydraminous. Above 24 weeks gestation, the AFI of less than five will signify oligohydraminous and more than 25 will signify polyhydraminous. For research purposes, the polyhydraminous can be graded into mild, moderate, and severe. And the measurements of the AFI and the DVPs can be assigned to each category. That's for research purposes. The measurements of um, amniotic fluid via these methods are reproducible, hence we can do serial measurements if we are following the AFI or the, the DVP for in the indicated purposes. The actual fluid measurements directly or via dye concentrations are also for research purposes. Hence, they will not be discussed in this uh, presentation. So when taking AFI or DVP, basically when you are taking your measurements, you have to be aware of uh, reverberations and you have to measure from the uterine wall. You also should not include cord or fetal parts. You have to turn down the gain to aid you and have an, a high index of suspicion. So you have to be able to know what is um, abdominal wall and what is a reflection of the wall. So as you can see there, the CASA markers where they, they are placed and there's no fetal parts involved there. So here are the AFI ranges across um, gestational ages. From this table, you can appreciate the steady increase in amniotic fluid in all the centiles, steady increase, and uh, there about um, 34 weeks, it uh, kind of drops. Clinical significance of amniotic fluid. 
Amniotic fluid can point to underlying pathology. And we always have to investigate warning signs. Polyhydraminos can be acute or chronic. If the fluid accumulates chronically, usually the maternal compromise is not that significant as the mother can compensate for the increase, unlike when it happens in an acute scenario. And uh, depending on the gestation, it can um, it can impair the respiratory system because of pressure it exerts on the lungs. This is for advanced uh, gestations, and also the weight that it um, exerts on the around the pelvis region, impeding venous blood return. Polyhydraminose is mainly due to increased production or decreased uptake. In oligohydraminose, there's usually decreased production or increased loss. Also, the clinical significance of amniotic fluid is uh, we can actually do amniocentesis from the amniotic fluid. And these are for pregnancies where there is um, high risk of aneuploidy. So if the mother went for a structural scan and we found a single umbilical artery, this will point to chances of there being a chromosomal disorders as well as a unilateral renal artery. So how do we perform amniotic or amniocentesis? This is a transabdominal prenatal diagnostic procedure. It is carried out around uh, 15 to 20 weeks gestation after chorioamnion fusion has occurred. Before then, it makes uh, sampling difficult. Amniocentesis um, evaluates genetic disorders, congenital infections, aluminization, and um, fetal lung maturity. For fetal lung maturity, we can measure the uh, lecithin sphingomyelin ratio, we can check for lamellar bodies, and uh, for genetic disorders, the amniocytes can be cultured and further investigations like karyotyping be done on them. So this is a septic procedure, it's, uh, it's an aseptic procedure, sorry using a 22, 20 to a 22 G spinal needle. And it's also done under ultrasound guidance. An aspirate of around uh, 20 to 30 mil is taken. Before taking this aspirate, the first the two to three mils of aspirate should be discarded as they possibly contain maternal cells. On doing this procedure, you have to document the color and the clarity of the amniotic fluid. And at the end of the procedure, you should evaluate the fetal cardiac motion. If the mother is Rh negative and not yet sensitized, you have to give anti-D immune globin. The risks involved in um, doing amniocentesis, it can lead to fetal loss, a very small chance, 0.1 to 0.3% chance of uh, fetal loss. It can also lead to amniotic fluid leakage, as well as spotting and club foot. The rates of complications occurring are higher if amniotic fluid is performed um, at uh, smaller gestations, like gestation 11 to 14 weeks. 
Also, if there is um, trauma to the fetus and the blood supply has been interrupted, it can lead to loss of fetal parts, like amputations. This is how pictures showing how amniotic fluid sampling is done. Amniocentesis. The transducer probe is there. The needle is there. And they are careful not to injure the fetus. All right, moving on to causes of um, polyhydraminous. So there could be increased production, like I mentioned before, seen in uh, diabetes mellitus. So hyperglycemia in the mother leads to fetal hyperglycemia. And also this will lead to fetal polyuria. Hence, um, hence polyhydraminous. In TTS, twin twin transfusion syndrome, usually one twin develops uh, polyhydraminous while the other develops oligo. So this is just due to hyperperfusion of the other twin. In uh, renal hamartoma, benign tumor of the kidney. Uh, this can lead to reninism, leading to activation of or, or hyperactivation of the renin angiotensin system, hence leading to increased uh, flow of uh, blood to the kidneys and um, increased urine production. Fetal anemia can also lead to polyhydraminous. Uh, this state um, usually leads to increase in cardiac output, hence uh, increase in uh, urine production, leading to increased uh, amniotic fluid. Unilateral uh, pelvic Uteric junction obstruction also can lead to polyhydraminous as well as uh, congenital abnormalities. So, abnormalities like uh, trisomy 18, trisomy 21, um, when they lead to uh, high cardiac output states or anemia. Polyhydraminous can also be caused by decreased uptake. And this could be due to decreased swallowing involving CNS, uh, central nervous system abnormalities and musculoskeletal disorders, anencephaly and other CNS malformation. Obstruction of the GIT and also of the respiratory system also can lead to polyhydraminous. So if the GIT is obstructed, like there is duodenal atresia, um, then uh, there won't be that GIT resorption. Fetal structural abnormalities also involve possibly chromosomal disorders leading to um, obstructions. Wake up for polyhydraminous. Polyhydraminous complicates uh, about 1 to 2 percent of singleton pregnancies and uh, is more common in multiple gestations or multiple pregnancies, twins or higher. And uh, it's picked by seeing an SFH, a symphysis fundal height, 
which exceeds um, expected for gestational age. And the uterus usually feels tense and fetal parts are difficult to palpate. So as part of the workup, we have to check for diabetes. We have to type the, the, the mother's blood Rh factor, resus factor, and also do the RPR or the check for torch infections. We also can do the mid cerebral cerebral artery SPV measurements to rule out um, anemia. So in case of fetal anemia, there's uh, increased cardiac output and uh, also decreased in uh, blood uh, viscosity. This leads to uh, peak um, systolic velocity measurements increasing and this can be measured and the ranges um, used to evaluate the fetal anemia. So on ultrasound, if uh, a hydropic fetus or placenta is seen, this is usually associated with uh, cardiac output states as well as alloimmunization. There's always concern for preterm labor because of the overdistended um, uterus. So symptoms of preterm labor should always be checked and if uh, the membranes do rupture there's always a risk of a uh, quad prolapse there's also a risk of um, abruptio placentae due to overstretched uh, uterus as well as um, risk of um, postpartum hemorrhage post delivery so we should also assess the uh, maternal compromise. Renal and respiratory compromise can be seen in poly as the, 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 the weight, the weight from the, the uterus can exert pressure on the ureters there, obstructing flow of urine from the, from the kidneys into the bladder hydronephrosis can occur, infections can follow the obstruction, and uh, UTI uh, symptoms can also be seen. Uh, respiratory compromise, uh, usually dyspnea, if the polyhydraminose is severe, the mom will have, uh, the mother will have uh, problems with breathing. Treatment for polyhydraminous. You should always treat the underlying cause. And the amnio reduction can always be done if there is um, a maternal respiratory compromise or there is um, risk of preterm labor. This is done under ultrasound guidance and tocolysis. A large bone needle around 18 to 20 g is used and a liter to two liters of fluid is removed slowly over 30 minutes and uh, an upper level measurement of uh, AFI for the gestation can be left so fetal cardiac activity should always be evaluated post the procedure and uh, admit the mom for observation for for 48 hours afterwards you can do serial afi measurements till early term and you can repeat um, reductions if indicated delivery if indicated uh, is done around um, early term so 37 to 38 weeks gestation and you have to do controlled uh, artificial rupture of membranes. So this is if there's still polyhydraminous at this gestation. And pediatric doctor should be 
involved to evaluate the newborn because um, polyhydraminous requiring amnio reduction is always associated with or almost most of the cases is associated with um, an underlying fetal pathology. Now moving on to oligohydraminous. So for oligohydraminous, causes could be increased loss or decreased production. So iatrogenic um, losses, maybe when sampling was taken, an amniocentesis sample, or a procedure was done on the mom leading to, to rupture of membranes. Or the membranes can rupture spontaneously even. This will lead to loss of amniotic fluid. And for decreased production, this is seen mostly in renal agenesis or dysplasia, as uh, the kidneys are the most uh, or the major contributor of the amniotic fluid. So if they're poorly developed or underdeveloped, then uh, urine production component will be missing. If there's bilateral renal obstruction, also leading to no urine contribution. If there is a posterior urethral valves, these are the membranous valves that uh, can cause blockage, uh, outlet urine, outlet uh, obstruction, and uh, use of uh, maternal prostaglandin inhibitors as well can lead to decreased uh, amniotic fluid. Uh, any condition causing uterine placenta is insufficiency. Uh, these are issues which lead, we, which deal with um, circulation. Circulation issues, there's a decreased uh, uterine placenta insufficiency, hence there is decreased uh, blood flow to the fetus, hence there is a uh, decreased uh, flow to the uh, fetal kidneys, hence there is a uh, decreased um, urine production. Pulmonary hypoplasia can also lead to decreased um, amniotic fluid production. This will take away the respiratory system contribution of um, amniotic fluid production, which is seen in advanced uh, gestations. The wake up for oligohydraminous. We have to be aware of oligohydraminous because it also complicates about uh, 11, sorry, about one to 2% of pregnancies. The severe form of um, Oligohydraminous is called anhydraminous, where there is no measurable fluid pockets. So history is important as well. Uh, history of um, AC inhibitors or ARB use as well in uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the use of uh, AC inhibitors affects uh, the fetal kidney development, hence this will affect uh, urine production. We should also exclude rupture of membranes and uh, perform a targeted structural ultrasound. We should also rule out causes of uteroplacental insufficiency like preeclampsia or vascular disorders. And uh, fetal growth assessment should be carried out, um, assessing the umbilical artery Dopplers and uh, growth, plotting on growth charts and um, UAD charts as indicated by the
protocols. So if you are following the small for gestational age protocol or the abnormal umbilical artery protocol. In case the oligohydraminos is associated with suspected um, post-term fetus, this is where we we don't know the, the gestation, we don't have, um, the mom is not sure of her dates, she doesn't have an early scan, uh, she's a late booker, so even the SFH measurements cannot be trusted. So we can do weekly AFI measurements and uh, aim for delivery once the AFI drops below 5 centimeters. Management of uh, oligohydraminous. So you need close fetal surveillance. Before 36 weeks gestation with normal growth and uh, normal umbilical artery Dopplers, expectant management is carried out and delivery will be between 36 plus zero and 36 plus six um, days. If uh, there's normal umbilical artery and normal growth, but the rupture of membranes has been confirmed. You have to give antibiotics and aim for delivery at uh, 34 weeks, 34 plus weeks. If oligohydraminous is associated with um, small for gestation, small for gestational age and uh, normal umbilical artery Dopplers, we have to follow the SGA protocols. And here we have to rule out uh, preeclampsia every two weeks. We have to advise the mom to do kick chart, kick count chart once uh, the fetus is viable. And uh, in labor, there has to be continuous CTG. So for the SGA protocols, we have to do the growth scans and plot the charts as indicated, as well as um, UAD measurements as uh, indicated. In case the fetus plots below P3 at 34 weeks, and the LICA is normal, and there's adequate growth, and the CTG is reactive, we aim to deliver at um, 36 plus zero to 36 plus six days. If the fetus falls below P3 at 34 weeks and the deep vertical pull is less than two centimeters, we do the CTG. If it's non-reactive, we expedite delivery, but if is reactive, we can repeat at 35 weeks and aim to deliver at 36 weeks. Patient should be seen at a correct hospital care level for the gestation and for the estimated fetal weight. If at 34 weeks, the fetus is plotting between P3 and P10 with a normal umbilical artery Dopplers and no preeclampsia. We can scan again at 36 weeks with uh, a growth scan and um, deep vertical pull and CTG. If the estimated fetal weight is more than P3 and there's adequate growth and normal lycra and the CTG is reactive, we aim to deliver at 40 weeks. If growth is slowing or the lycra is reduced, that is DVP less than two, we do CTG. If it is reactive, we aim to deliver at 37 weeks. If uh, non-reactive, we have to aim for delivery, earlier delivery. 
so yeah now if um, the umbilical artery dopplers are abnormal with a resistance index above the 95th centile we have to rule out preeclampsia on a weekly basis and once the fetus is viable that is above 27 weeks and with uh, has an estimated fetal weight more than 800 grams we have to advise the mom to do the daily kick chart kick chart kick count chart and we do ctg twice a week at uh, level one care hospital sorry at high level of care hospital like tiger back so we also do weekly umbilical artery dopplers we have to do growth scan as well at 33 weeks and uh, we have to aim for early delivery if there is a preeclampsia or if uh, the dvp is less than two centimeters or the growth blood tubes or even if the ctg is non-reassuring if there are no aggravating factors induction of labor can be done at uh, 36 weeks gestation all deliveries before 34 weeks need um, steroids for lung maturity and also to prevent um, necrotizing colitis enterocolitis and also to prevent uh, intracranial hemorrhages if uh, the deliveries happen before 32 weeks magnesium sulfate should also be added to offer neuro protection for the fetus so the protocols for other features concerning features should also be considered and treatments are implemented accordingly um amno infusion can also be done to alleviate the variable decelerations caused by cord compression and if there's fetal or maternal compromise delivery always outweighs the risks of uh, prematurity complications associated with prematurity um now we'll look into complications associated with uh, amniotic fluid so for maternal complications i've picked a rare condition it's a rare but lethal condition um, called amniotic fluid embolization this can lead to sudden um, 